All right. Second video, we're going to go to transverse, or sorry, compression waves. Compression or longitudinal waves, which is up there in your title. Uh, the difference between a compression wave and a transverse wave is that as opposed to a transverse wave, the particles are going to move parallel to the direction of uh, the, the direction that the wave moves. Particles move parallel to the direction that the wave moves. And they're called compression waves because you get these areas of compression, right? So again, in this particular video or this picture, I'm not sure if I have an animation with this one or not, uh, the wave will move from left to right and the particles move parallel to that direction. So instead of going perpendicularly up and down, they move left and right, left and right. It's still true, however, that this wave, just like the, the transverse wave, it's still true that it does not carry matter. And a really good example of a longitudinal wave is a big long spring or a slinky. Each individual little ring of the slinky can be considered as an individual particle. And you can trace that individual particle, and as the wave moves past, that particle will move to the right, and it'll come back to the left. But it doesn't have any net direction of movement. So examples of compression waves, you really need to know these. Sound is the best example of compression waves that we know of. We're going to talk about sound extensively pretty soon. Uh, some earthquake, earthquake waves are compression waves, the ones that specifically go through the earth, not the surface waves. Those are usually transverse. Uh, some, sometimes tsunamis in the ocean uh, can be propagated as a compression wave through the water. Um, and the reason why they're called compression waves, again, like I said, is, is you have these areas of compression and these areas of what we call rarefaction. And we'll go over that in a second. So here's a video of a longitudinal wave, an animation. As you can see, the wave is very easy to tell that it moves from left to right. It starts with the red bar, and we can trace the, ray, the wave as it goes to the right across our screen. But if you look at each individual particle, you'll notice, for instance, we'll pick out this one. Notice it goes right and then comes back to rest to the left. Right and then left and comes to rest. Right and then left and comes to rest. So the individual particles do not move. We don't transfer matter just like in a uh, transverse wave. So here's an example of a repetitive compression wave or longitudinal wave. Um, oscillations in the same direction of wave movement. The wave energy will move from left to right, for instance. And if that's the case, then the particles also oscillate left to right. It's parallel, not perpendicular. All right, so you can watch that with each one of these particles again. Right, left, right, left, right, left, etc., etc. Again, as far as examples are concerned, we said sound already. You can put slinky down there if you'd like. Uh, earthquakes. Many of these types of things are compression waves. As far as the anatomy of a compression wave, this is what you need to copy down. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Do this on the picture of the slinky that's there in your notes. Really only three basic terms that we need to know. There's the wavelength. Sorry, we'll go with compression first. Starting off in the wrong foot again. Uh, compression can be defined as an increase in medium density. Okay, they may sound kind of complicated. Basically, it's where the stuff gets closer together. Okay, and we'll go back to our animation to see that. You can see the darker areas that are moving across. It's actually the darker areas that we're following. It's the compressions that we're following to watch the wave move across. The reason why your eye follows the compression is because it's darker, because the objects actually are, the, the dots in this case, are a little bit closer together. And so that's the reason why you can see it move. So the compression is the area where there's an increase in density. And you can see it with this slinky. The slinky is very close together. The rings are close together here. Whereas at a rarefaction, an area of rarefaction, 
uh, you have a decrease in median density. The, the rings get farther apart in this case. In our previous an, uh, animation, the areas of rarefaction are the areas in between the darker lines and the particles are farther apart. They're less densely packed together. So those are the two new parts of a compression wave that you need to know. The wavelength is the same definition though. It's still the distance between successive parts of a wave. And you can either go from compression to compression. You can go from the middle of the rarefaction to the middle of the next rarefaction. It's a little bit harder to do with a compression wave because it's harder to see where the bottom is and where the top is. Uh, harder than it is with a transverse wave, but that's still the concept as far as wavelength is concerned. All right, so you should have all those things copied down, definitions written. Ask the substitute, raise your hand to pause the video if you need more time. Okay, let's move forward and go ahead and look at frequency. There's things about a wave that we need to be able to calculate. All right? So we can calculate the wave frequency and the period of a wave. Uh, and why don't you go ahead and just write these equations down there in the box. So frequency, F is 1 over T. And make sure you write a capital T for this T. That's very important. And then the capital T is 1 over F. Those are the two equations that you need to know. They're really just reciprocals of each other. Effectively, this is the same equation that is algebraically manipulated um, to solve for either F or T. You do not have to memorize these algebraic manipulations. It's actually pretty simple uh, just to know that the T and the F will flop places if you need to solve for one or the other. But you don't have to memorize the equation because it is in your chart. And we have now finally moved to the back of the chart. Everybody say, woo! All right, so if you look at the back of your equation chart, everybody should have one. Look at the back part in the section that says waves and optics. Here it is right here. And if you look at number 45, frequency. Frequency is in hertz. We'll talk about that in a second, hz. Uh, and frequency is 1 divided by period. Again, it's the same equation as period, capital T. Period is 1 divided by frequency. All right, so there's your equation. You do not have to memorize it. Wavelength first. Again, we've defined wavelength already. It's the distance from crest to crest, distance from trough to trough. It can also be defined as, and I would want you to write this down because you've already written the first part, just write the distance to complete one full cycle distance to complete one full cycle. So that's wavelength. Symbol for wavelength, as I said before, is the Greek letter lambda. You might want to write down lambda, L-A-M-B-D-A. -A. And the unit is meters. We're talking about distance, and all distances in this class are measured in meters. So wavelength is just another distance. It's just a special kind of distance. And then frequency is the reciprocal of wavelength and it's the number of cycles or oscillations per second. So cycles per second, and you'll hear me say that a lot. Cycles per second. Symbol for wavelength is F and the unit is Hertz, symbolized as HZ. And that says one divided by seconds. In other words, Hertz is how many cycles per second. I'm sorry, I told you wrong. I said that frequency is the reciprocal of wavelength. That is not true. I was thinking about the next one, which is the period. Frequency is determined by the period because period and frequency are reciprocals of each other. That's what uh, is depicted here in this equation. The period is the time it takes for one cycle. So short definition, time for one cycle. That's what I'm writing. We've already had this before when we got to circular motion. The period in, revol in, re in relation to circular motion is the amount of time it took for one circle. So period for anything is the amount of time for one complete cycle of whatever you're doing. Uh, the symbol for period, it's important that you know it's a capital T, not a lowercase t. Lowercase t is time in general, and period is a specific kind of time, but the units are still going to be in seconds. Okay, so that hasn't changed. Wavelength, frequency, and period. Three things that you need to know how to calculate in regard to any wave. Alright, so let's look at this practice problem. 
I have a red light. Red light is uh, a form of electromagnetic radiation. That's a transverse wave. And it has a frequency of 10 to the 15th hertz. We want to know what its period is. All right, so it's not that difficult. They're giving us frequency, and they want to know the period, which is T. Well, if we want to know period, we can use this one here. Now, remember, this is in your equation chart, and in the chart, it's just going to show you F is 1 over T. Well, all you have to do if you're solving for T is just flop the places of the F and the T. That's all you really need to do. All right, so as far as the equation, I know that period is 1 over the frequency, and then we're just going to plug in 1 divided by 10 to the 15th. Punch that in your calculator real quick. If you do that, you'll get this. 1 e negative 15 or 1 times 10 to the negative 15th. In other words, all you're really doing is throwing a negative on that exponent there. Didn't mean to put that there. Uh, so the period is 1 times 10 to the negative 15th. Remember period, the units are seconds. So this is seconds. So here's what this means. A red light has a frequency of 10 to the 15th hertz. That's a really big number. In other words, remember the frequency, the frequency of number of cycles per second. So that means this red light in one second completes 10 to the 15th cycles in one second. That's a crazy high number of cycles per second. And the point is, if it has that high of a frequency, it had better have a very, very low period because the period is the amount of time it takes to complete one cycle. And if you're going to do 10 to the 15 cycles in one second, you better complete one cycle in 1 times 10 to the negative 15 seconds. In other words, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 that many seconds. It's not even milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds. It's like way, way, way even smaller than that. Amount of time to complete one cycle is extremely low if the frequency is extremely high. And you might want to write that. Remember this equation. Because of the way these variables are related, necessarily period and frequency are inversely related to each other. In other words, if period goes up, frequency goes down and vice versa. If period goes down, frequency goes up, right? If we have a very low period, in other words, not much time to complete a cycle, the frequency is going to be very high because you're going to complete a lot of cycles per second. Whereas if your period is high, a lot of time for one cycle, that means you're not going to be able to complete very many cycles in one second and your frequency is going to be low. So those two are inversely related to each other.